Let's turn to the Word of God, please. Let's turn to the book of Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah, please, chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning to read verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with the pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the tree, green trees upon the high hills. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil, and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For you have kindled a fire in mine anger which shall burn forever. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, and a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As a partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so is he that getteth riches and not by right, and shall leave them in the midst of his days, and that his end shall be a fool. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For thou art my praise. Keep your Bible open. Let's just buy in a word of prayer again. Father, Will you settle us in your house and in your presence again this evening? We thank you, you have brought us here. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to come. And now we pray, Lord, that your spirit would settle every one of us and speak to our hearts through your own word. And glorify the Lord Jesus Christ for his glory and for his name's sake we ask it. Amen. Tonight we want to speak on God's movie trailer of how he sees it. God's movie trailer of how he sees it. In other words, when we look at our world that we live in, our society, we look at our nation, when we look at the world in general, and the things that we hear on our news every day, and we see the things that are, are now just commonplace that would never have been known ever in society. We see how the depths of the poverty our nation has allowed itself to sink into. We have to often wonder then, how does God see it? Because many of us seem blind to it, dead to it. And in fact, even the church, they're really numb toward it also. But it's not really how a preacher sees it or even how a pastor sees it or a Christian sees it. It's how does God see it? 
What does God say about our nation? And what does God say about the individual man and woman who turns away from his son, the Lord Jesus? You see, Israel had separated into two kingdoms and the house of Israel in the north had been carried away captive by the time of our reading. And now the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, is writing and speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. And he's given them and showing them, as it were, we could call it a video today. Bear with me and I'll show you. And he shows them a mirror image of themselves through his word and through his prophet. And he says to them, what are you going to do about this? And so when we're reading this, he says that if they turn, he will help them and bless them and prosper them and protect them. According to his own word, he has promised. He sees the condition that they're in. And listen, their national condition, their financial condition, or their economical condition. He also sees their their military condition, how they're, even their protection when they look at their own military, how they are compared to the nations and the threat that's in their world at that time. But more than that, he sees their spiritual condition. And it's the spiritual condition from the man and the woman, from the leadership of the nation, from the leadership, as it were, of the religious establishment of the day, that God speaks into them and says, because I have called you, even your own armies won't protect you anymore. You have no boundaries, nor barriers, nor borders from the heathen coming in, and they'll carry you away captive, for my protection is no longer with you, Judah. And of course, he calls them to repent, and they don't many times. And of course, even Jeremiah is thrown into a hole in the a pit in the hole in the ground, a hole uh, as a prison camp for him. And they turn away God's prophet, they turn away God's word. The word here, uh, heart, is mentioned in our reading four times. First of all, in verse one, look at it. He shows them the condition of their heart. Verse one says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with the point of a diamond. It is written in the tables of their hearts and upon the horns of their altars. So here we have a sin-engraved heart. In other words, it's deep within your being. It's deep within your heart. It's engraven like with a diamond, with an iron pen. It's that deep. Secondly, we have in verse 5, Look what the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. So here we have a a departed heart, or a backslidden heart. Someone who's went cold and backslidden in heart, and the Lord is no longer in the forefront of their mind. Thirdly, we have in verse 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it. The Lord says that our hearts deceive ourselves. So thirdly, in verse 9, we have the deceitful, wicked heart. And then fourthly, in verse 10, we, he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Notice this. Here we have the transparent and manifest heart before God. The sin-engraved heart, the carnal, departed, or backslidden heart. We have the deceitful, wicked heart that deceives the people who own their hearts. And we have the transparent, manifest heart. So God points out by the prophet Jeremiah, I see your heart. I see the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is in the heart of the leadership of Judah. The root of the problem is in the heart of the ecclesiastical leadership, the military leadership, the governmental leadership of Judah. And the Lord is pointing this out and he's saying, so the people are going as they are led, for sheep are led. He says, and as they are leading you, there's only one hope for you, 
And we find him in verse 13 of our reading. It says, O Lord, the hope of Israel. They had no other hope. They had no other way of deliverance, no other way of salvation. Only in the Lord. He was their only hope. God knows their ways. And so he's given them a look, as it were, in a mirror as to how they really stand before him. And he says they have a heart engraved with sin. It has caused them to depart and backslide from the Lord. Their heart has and is deceiving them, and God knows every bit of it. I think it would be safe to say we could say that about our own nation tonight. We could say that about much of the church leadership and establishment tonight. And we could say that in many people tonight in our nation, individuals, that their hearts have went cold before God, that church leaders, many have apostatized away from the true faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And they have apostatized, and now the people have followed suit. And they ecumenize and, uh, and they worship other gods and other idols. They, they're allowing so much to happen in the church. And because the church is going wrong, listen, then the nation goes. For as goes the church, so goes, goes the nation. For the church is the heart of the nation. And the heart of the church should be Christ. But when the heart is not Christ in the church, then the church goes wrong and the heart of the nation goes wrong also. It follows suit. The word here for heart needs to be looked at. The word heart is the Hebrew word labor. And this is what it means. It means the feelings, the will, the intellect, the center of everything. Let me say it again. The feelings, the will, the intellect, the center of everything. Let me give you an example. When you go to, say, Belfast and right into the heart of the city where all the main activity, the shopping areas and all of that's going on there, where the people flock in, say, on a Saturday and it's a hive of activity, that is the lab of the city. It is the place, the, the feeling of the city. It's the, the, the very center of everything of the city. It's where the commerce uh, mainly is there and it affects the outskirts of it. It's the same with a man and a woman when we speak of our heart, the fleshy organ that beats deep within the center of us. It keeps beating. It's where our, our feeling and will, as it were, it's our center that keeps us going. And when we have a, a, a heart attack or cardiac arrest, then, you know, things can be over. The center or the heart of temple worship in the day here of Jeremiah had went so apostatized that, you know, that they no longer worship in true Hebraic worship. They no longer loved the Lord God of their fathers. They no longer had true worship at all, but rather their heart was engraved with their sin. And they loved to have it so. Their traditions of men had taken over the law of God. They had placed traditions and they had placed false sacrifices that God would not accept. And so Jeremiah the prophet is sent by the Lord with a pleading voice. Listen, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he cried over his people's sin. He knew what was coming. He warned them and they wouldn't listen. And he pleaded with them and he cried. I suppose in a small measure, every preacher should know what that is like. Every preacher should be pleading with all that he has, pleading from the depths of his heart, pleading with the Word of God, pleading, not storytelling, not ear-tickling, not back-patting, but pleading with men and women to get right with God, to say there's coming a day and you must be ready. And instead, many preachers are not pleading Many preachers rather are turning their back for pay packets. Notice this. The heart would be knocked out of Judah. That is their temple worship. God's word, the service, worship, reverence, everything was gone. And God gives us an idea of what all of Israel were like 
That is the northern and the southern kingdoms in Isaiah chapter 1. If you'll turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 1. God gives them, as it were, a preview. He gives them a trailer of what their nation is like. I pray that God would give our nation a preview, that God would give us a movie trailer experience that we would sit and watch it to see what our nation has become, what our little province has become. That God would let us see with open eyes and an open heart that he would let us see the, the very depravity that our land has fallen into and turned away from the Lord. Notice what it says in Isaiah 1, in verse 4. He says, ah, sinful nation. God says this. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Notice what the Lord says to Israel. He says this before the northern kingdoms carried away. He says to them, he's, he's saying, look, I'm going to show you what you are like in your heart. And I'm going to show you how your heart has allowed your nation to go. And I'm going to show you what, if I can call it, your church at that time, that is the, the ecclesiastical or worship at that time. I'm going to show you, for they put in bulls, uh, bull calves to worship idols in Dan and Bethel. And then they stopped them going to Jerusalem. They put these in that they would go to the high places and into mountains and into grove trees to worship the, the gods of, of other worlds or, or the, 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 the deities of the underworld. And they thought they were worshiping Yahweh. And God says, this isn't me at all. These are found spirits that you're worshiping and that is leading you aside and taking you away. He says, these things are off the wicked one, the devil. You're a seed of evildoers doing this. He says, and I love you. But I must deal with it. And he says, and, and your nation as a, as a people, your heart is grossly immoral. And you're far away from me. And he pleads with them to turn before it's too late. He says to them, he says, you're a sinful nation. You're laden with iniquity. You're a seed of evildoers. You're corruptors, he says. You've forsaken the Lord and you've provoked me. He says, every time, he says, you turn away from me, you're provoking me to my face. Lord, why? Why did you not deal with them quicker? Why did you not just deal with them at the first time and have it over and done with? I'll tell you why, brothers and sisters, because he loved them. Because he's gracious. Because he's kind. Because he's good. Because he's merciful. Do you know why God doesn't deal with the church? Do you know why God doesn't deal with the individual Christian that lets him down like you and me? Because he's good. Because he's kind. Because he's gracious. And because he loves us. Do you know why God hasn't wiped Great Britain off the face of the earth? Because he's good. Because he's kind. Because he's merciful. And because he's gracious. Because he loves us. He wants us to be saved. Many people say, well, Lord, why this one? And why did that one die? Or why did this happen to this one? Listen, friend, we need to leave those things with the Lord. But the Lord has spoken many times to many people, and they have went out into eternity before the end of the week. God was kind and gracious and merciful. They wouldn't listen. He says to them, why will you revolt more and more? Why? You're throwing it in my face and my love is towards you. I'm being lenient here. I'm, I'm, I'm long-suffering. I'm holding back wrath. But there comes a time when even the cup of iniquity is full. And God must pour out the dregs. He says the whole head is sick. 
the whole heart is faint. You know what he's saying? Your government, your king. There were two kings, one in Samaria and one in Judah at this time. The house of Judah and the house of Israel, the two kingdoms. And there's one in Samaria, a line of kings like Ahab and others, and one in, Judah, in Jerusalem and Judah. And he says to them, your whole head is sick. He says, your, 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 your monarchy, your, your government line is sick. He says, they're, they're, they're turning away from me. He says, your whole heart, your ecclesiastical leadership, he says, are faint. They no longer stand for me anymore. The ecclesiastical leadership in your nation, he says, they don't come to me the way I demanded from them. They don't lead the people right. Imagine the Lord saying, from John O'Groats to Land's End, from London to London Derry, imagine him saying these words to us, to our nation tonight. From the sole of your foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Listen to what he says in verse 7. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. All I can see on the news this weather is riots and trouble and bombs and fire. Think of France and the things that are happening in France and in Belgium. And they're outside the gates of Britain. It's just a little stretch of water until it reaches our shores again. Your cities will be burned up, he says, but turn on to me. For the moon god of Islam will come to overtake your people. Oh, friend, he says your monarchy, your government, your, your church, the heart of it is, he says, <laughs> it's faint. There's no strength in it. The church, of, the church, especially the established church, but the church in general has become so afraid, so laid back, so politically correct. As I said, they're afraid of pay packets being lost. Brothers and sisters, when I stand before Christ in that day, I'm not going to say, Lord, I sat from a pay packet. I hope you forgive me. I'm going to say, Lord, I don't what you told me. I preach what you said. If you turn with me to the prophet Hosea, the prophet Hosea, he says to the northern kingdom, this is before they were carried away around 120 years before we read Jeremiah here speaking to the Jew to the southern kingdom. Listen to what the Lord says to the house of Israel. In the book of Hosea, chapter 5, Now notice we've mentioned the whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint, the government, the monarchy as it were. And now the religious establishment or the church as we would say today. Hosea chapter 5 verse 1. Hear ye this, O priests, and hearken ye house of Israel, and give ear, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you, because ye have been a snare on Mizpah, and the nets spread upon Tabor. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. I know Ephraim. That is a name for the northern kingdom and also a tribe there. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. For the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them. They have not known me. Pardon me, they have not known the Lord. And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah shall also, also shall fall with them. They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord. For they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. Blow ye the cornet in Gebeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. 
Cry aloud at Bethlehem after thee, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. Have I made known that which shall surely be? The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after, their, after the commandment. Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a moth and to the house of Judah as rottenness. Now notice this. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent unto King Jareb. Yet could he not heal you nor cure you off your wound. Now notice this in verse 11. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound. Will you say for me, saw? Saw. Would you say it again? Saw. When Ephraim saw his sickness. Would you repeat that for me? When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound. See the word saw here. It's a Hebrew word, ra'ah. And it has corresponding words. For example, ra'ah means to discern something. When Ephraim discerned how sick the nation was. Ephraim was a tribe, but it also got the name for the whole ten tribes in the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. And it says, when Ephraim saw, he discerned. And it gives the idea to look one upon another. In other words, now some people in our, our nation of ours in Great Britain and the United Kingdom, we're able to see sometimes, we're able to see what's happening and what's going on in the nation and others can't see it. We're able to discern signs of the times. We're able to see, well, I remember in my younger days that wouldn't have happened and this would never have taken place and how dangerous things are. And sure, even the pedophiles are only getting a slap in the wrist and sent to prison for a year or two and released. It have thrown away the key before. All of these terrible things that are going on. We would never have seen this happen in our nation. And now we are seeing it. And most of the people are blind and they're going on with it. But when the church is trying to take a stand. And when men are trying to preach out in righteousness. Then they become the ones who are not politically correct. And now we become the, the truth becomes hate. And truth preachers are now hate preachers. I'd be called a hate preacher because of it. Because we preach the truth, it means to discern, to look one on another. So at one point in the kingdom, they started to realize what is happening in our nation. What is going on? And people are starting to turn like that. What is happening? But they're looking, but they're looking the wrong way as Ephraim looked in the days of old. In Hosea chapter 5, notice what it says. When Ephraim saw his sickness, Judah saw his wound. Then went Ephraim to the Assyrian. It ended up that it was the Assyrian who became his worst enemy. The Assyrian was the one who came and took away the, the northern ten tribe kingdom into captivity and replaced them with a, another heathen people. But that's where they wanted. They were looking. They were saying, where do we go? They would try anything and go anywhere but to the Lord but to the Lord. And our nation is the same. We'll try anything. We'll go anywhere. I remember Gordon Brown a lot of years ago. He went cap and hand to Saudi Arabia begging for money. Thank the Lord that we are looking to trigger Article 50 for Brexit, that we will be out of the beast of Europe for no longer should we give them their money and we go with a begging bowl to them to see how we can spend our money. Still not going to fix us. We need to turn to the Lord. We need men and women. We need Christians on the street. We need Christians in the workplace. We need everyone who everywhere you come across, no matter why you're shopping, wherever it is, to take a stand for the truth of the word. Even if it costs us, we must stand. It may cost me my job, but it may cost me mine too. It cost me my freedom. But if I'm all right with him, and he's all right with me, 
and God plus one is a majority. The word here, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, it means they discerned, they started to see, what are we going to do because things have gotten really bad and the worship now was just heathen idolatry everywhere. There was atheism, there was godlessness. Everywhere you went, you would have seen the, the Baal worship that came out of Babylon and them worshiping bound down before idols and false gods. Little children were being burned alive in fires onto these false gods. They were taking their babies and putting them in to uh, brazen uh, uh, idols who stood like this and they placed the baby into it and they stuffed it with flammables and they set fire to it and cooked their children alive to appease the gods of the heathen that they thought they were appeasing. And God says in the scriptures, no, no, you do not get your children to walk through the fires of Moloch. Brothers and sisters, and we're appeasing the God, the, the, the God of, of liberalism whenever we have abortion clinics. We're appeasing in the gods of the modern age when young little babies are being cut to pieces in the womb. God says, I am against this. I am against this, he says. And he starts to show them Stay with me. The movie trailer. The word saw, ra'ah, means to discern, to look one on another. The, the Septuagint, now the Septuagint is the, you know, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, mainly in Hebrew in the Old, and New Testament is Greek. Well, the, the Greek uh, Septuagint is the all of the Bible written in Greek, Hebrew and all. And the Greek word for this Hebrew word for saw, ra'o, is the word horao, and it means to have a vision, to see something, to have a vision. In other words, they started to look and they started to have a vision of what their nation had become and what had really happened, but they were powerless to change it. They were powerless to change it. And when we take that word, horio, or uh, uh, from the Hebrew, horio from the Greek, the Latin for it is the word video, where we get our word video. Video. God showed them one another and the state of their nation, and the state of their walk with him, showed them their ecclesiastical state, showed them their monarchy state. And he says, look, let me just show you. And through his spirit and word and the preaching of the prophets, he says, hear, O Judah, now hear Israel. Ephraim, listen, this is what you are. And that's God's view of it. That's how he sees it. Ephraim went to the Syrian and God showed him his sin and his condition and his hopelessness. He went another way. Anything else but God. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 23, James says, if, For if, there, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Listen, you can go and you can look in the mirror in the bathroom tonight before you go to bed, and you look at yourself in the mirror and you can say, I know who you are. I can see what you've become. I know where you have been. I know the sins. I know everything. I know it all. I know the coldness of your heart, and you can't fool the one you're looking at. But once you step away from that mirror, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. You forget it. Your heart deceives you. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The Lord says, once you come away from this, you're going to see, you'll run to the Assyrian and you'll see that your heart, well, you're able to live with yourself. I ask, is there someone here and God's speaking to you and showing you yourself. Is he showing you maybe someone that you need to put it right with? 
Is he showing you maybe coldness of a heart that you need to turn to him again? Maybe unsaved, and he's saying, here's your heart, I see it. And you know, when we're in the meeting, we're saying, no, I was nearly, it's like uh, Paul, when, when he was preaching and testifying, you know, the Agrippa and Felix were there, and, and he says, almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. He's seen himself for a moment at the persuasion of Paul. But as soon as he left, the presence of Paul was like leaving the mirror. It's like leaving the movie house. It's over. It's in that place again. And as soon as you leave, it's all over because our hearts deceive us. Oh, I pray that the Holy Ghost will write it on our hearts. Listen to what the hope is in verse 14. It says, Heal me, O Lord. Jeremiah 17 and 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. You know, whatever the sin has been, he can forgive it. And he will at a repentant heart. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. The Lord Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is Savior of the soul today, tonight. He is still the healer of the body, tonight. He is still the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, tonight. And I'd love to say, he's coming tonight, but I can't. No man knoweth the day and the hour, but he is the soon coming king. Tonight he is the soon coming king. The whole gospel for the whole man. Salvation in the kingdom. Salvation by grace. Through faith alone and Christ alone. I must round this up. First of all, the sin engraved heart, they had it engraved in their heart, their sin. But listen to what the Lord says. Proverbs 3 and verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table of thine heart. Mercy in God, truth of the word. And you know, you'll find that engraving of sin disappears. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Israel, now Judah, and Jerem by Jeremiah's time, uh, they had a heart for sin. They ran everywhere but the God. But eventually out of their heart, the mouth speaks. Do you know eventually out of your heart, you'll find that that is what will produce whatever your heart's filled with. There's some hearts and they get filled with lust. Some hearts and they get filled with adultery. And eventually that's what comes out of them. Some hearts and get filled with sin of some shape or form or another and eventually that's what takes hold of them. Out of the abundance of the heart. Look, if you're filled with something, it'll eventually overspill. It's like a, a glass of water under a tap of flowing water, it will eventually spill over. And our hearts are like that. We cannot hold or forbear forever. And just like the Lord's heart is filled with their sin and their revolt and their iniquity, then it spills over in wrath in him. He pours it out upon them. Such is the heart of a man and a woman who turn away from Christ. Who knows if this would be the last night Jesus would speak to us. Who knows if this is the last breath we'll take? And we'll go anywhere but to God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And of course, this is New Testament in Matthew's gospel. And it's written in Greek when Jesus is speaking this. 
You know what the word for heart here, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? You know what the word of heart for, for heart is? Cardia. Cardia. It's where you and I get cardiac from. I a cardiac arrest. The heart. What happens if there was a cardiac arrest in spirit tonight? God stopped dealing with you. What if God stopped wanting to use you and you kept throwing off his call to use you and you, you kept turning it away? What if God was calling you to get right with him and give him your heart? What if this was the last time God says, I'm going to call you? You've backslidden from me, but you'll try everything else. You'll go everywhere else. What if this was the last time? Like in Israel. And what if you're running to those things away from God like Ephraim going to the Assyrian and it turns out to be your biggest devil? This is your last time. Sin was engraved in their heart and they become so immersed in sin. The abundance of it overflowed. The Lord said, it's even went on to the horns of your altar. The things that they tied to the altar, the way their children were sacrificed. He says, hey, all that wickedness eventually comes out. It comes out in the lives of men and women. Some of the stories when you're ministering with some of the children, maybe the youth leaders could not tell you about them, but tell you of some of the stories of what happens. And in ministry, some of the children and the backgrounds they come from, because you see, their parents' hearts don't want to know the Lord, and they've become wicked and so wicked that, you know, the children grow up in such squalor and terrible lives. Such is our nation. The heart is sin engraved, it is departed, backslidden. The Lord says that they will be like a heath. And not see good comes, you know, heath, they're like a tumbleweed. Do you know the heath here is called a damask weed or a damask heath? And they weren't allowed to use it for anything religious because it was so useless. It wasn't planted, it, it stuck for a while and then blew off. It had no grounding, and it didn't bear fruit. And the Lord said in his word, you're not allowed to use this heath because it's nothing. There's no substance in it, he says. And this heath that the Lord says, it went into the ground a little and took from the surface water, but after a while, it either blew off and blew away with the wind or it withered up and died. The heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now listen, folks. The idea here is the heart was deceitful. It's a word, akob, and it means to attack the rear of an enemy. Like an enemy is coming and the army says, we'll come around this way and we'll plan our attack and from this flank or from the, from the back, and they won't know until we're on top of them. And the deceitful heart, that's the idea. The word akhob for deceitful means your own heart it gathers around your very will and feelings, your things that you think you're doing right, and attacks yourself. You don't even know your own mind, your own self, your own heart. It's deceiving you. So many are deceived. Says the Lord says that he knows the heart. It's incurable. It's transparent before him. I search the heart. He says, I try the reins. David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. One thought, and we're closed with this, two minutes. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17.
Jeremiah 17, and just one verse. Let your eye run down to verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they shall depart from me being written in the earth. Take note of that, being written in the earth. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Notice what he says, being written in the earth. Here is the difference. The psalmist is saying, no, or the prophet is saying, those who forsake you will be written in the earth. Do you know what Jesus says? Jesus says in Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 20, he says to rejoice in that your names are written in heaven. What in the Lamb's book of life? But many names are written in the earth. Do you remember the woman was taken into idolatry? Do you remember in John chapter 8? And the woman was taken in the very act and brought to Jesus and he got down. And what did he do? He started to write on the earth. Do you think Jesus doesn't know the book of Jeremiah? Here's who you are. Here's who you are. Here's who you are. Here's your sin. He starts with his finger to write on the earth. Because you see, a name written in the earth will be like the heath. When the wind comes after a while, it'll blow away. But those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, and whose names are written in heaven, they will shine the brightness of the firmament, the stars of glory. Is your name written in heaven? Hey, don't be saying, when I get saved, my name is written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven from before the foundation of the world. It was just ticked off. He's in. She's in. Has it been ticked off? You know, there's a new name written in glory. That may sound good, but that is not theologically correct. God sent his son for his people. If you're not saved, will you come to faith in Christ? For who knows if this could be the last time that he would say, I'm showing you a movie trailer of your life and you know it. Look, see when I got saved, the night I got saved and I came in steeped in alcohol and drugs, I sat under the sound of the word and it was like God was pulling out a filing cabinet in my brain and taking out a file and showing me everything that I'd even forgot about in my stupors in my drunken unconsciousness, in my drug-fueled parties. There's another one here. And what about this one you heard? What about this thing you did? And what about here? And lying on the road, middle of a road in the middle of the night, and a car near run over the top of me. He showed me the movie trailer, and he says, Nice son, here's the movie trailer. Here's who you are. See, without me, you're going to hell. Now, here's a movie trailer of how I see it. But when you're in Christ, he says, it's all erased away. It's all washed in the blood. And when I see it, I don't recognize it. All I see is my son. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Search me, O God, and know my heart.